Hi, I'm Tyler Hummel. You may remember me from such far-right neo-reactionary podcasts as Neo-Marxism for Dummies, and yes, they are a lot to get you. Joining us in a special episode is a, is a very special guest I've been excited to have on for a while. She is a grad student, an author, an SES with multiple websites, a part-time musician, part, uh, filmmaker, debater, and militant Christian apologist who has gone on shows like Unbelievable and Adam Friended. And I feel like I may or may not be fully giving her for full credit for her entire bibliography. Did I cover everything there? <laughs> yeah, you did. Uh, I, I'm not a filmmaker, though. I, I just do I just do film projects on YouTube for fun. But I, I don't actually go out there with a camera and film things. I just put throw things together on a, a film editor. And, so, yeah. That technically counts. Oh, and I should also mention her name is Esther O'Reilly. So I, I did. I just managed to falter on the lead already. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. So uh, I guess I got to start with the most important thing. Merry Christmas. This we're recording. Merry couple, Christmas. We're recording just a few days after Christmas. Uh, how has your holiday been? It's been great, and of course, it is still Christmas. I have to sometimes remind my. My Protestant friends who say, "Oh no, I can't listen to Christmas music for a whole another year." I'm like, guys, Christmas just started. It starts with Christmas Eve. That that ends. So enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's kind of a cultural mandate that Christmas kind of has to end on Christmas Day for whatever reason. It just it it feels so anticlimactic that I, that I hate it. But I, I kind of like the idea of just keeping like at, uh, liturgical Christianity for the win. Well, there you go. <laughs> Darn, yeah, we, unfortunately we're living in the hell that is uh, secular modernity where Christmas ends on Christmas, so. So tell us kind of what you've been uh, up to lately. I know you, you are probably the most industrious person I follow on Twitter, given everything you do. Uh, I wish, I wish I was more industrious. I, I, if you knew me, I go through you put up a good front. time without... <laughs> what? You put up a good front. I wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> I tweet a lot. That's my... I'm very industrious about tweeting. Uh, it's other things that sometimes get... Uh, get All right, we're back. So, I, you were just... I, I, I was just saying how you are incredibly uh, industrious on Twitter, and you were saying that you were... Or you were just saying you were just, in, just industrious on Twitter. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm industrious about tweeting. <laughs> Less industrious about other things sometimes. Well, it doesn't seem like it based on all the stuff you do and or have done. Is it like t t tell us a little bit how you kind of got into everything you do? I know that's a big. I, guess I know that's a big you're, question. You're so. <laughs> oh sure, it, it, it is a big question. It's a, it's a fair question. Um, so. I started a blog way, way back in high school, um, just a little WordPress thing, and it was just this cute thing where I wrote about stuff that interested me, and um, actually, of all things, I wrote mostly about Southern gospel music, which is this, this completely random, niche thing that you wouldn't really have guessed from what I do now. Um, but. Um, friends or people to talk to just because I was, um, you know, I was, I was homeschooled and I was kind of different and I didn't know a lot of people who shared my interests, so I would kind of go around the internet, uh, try to find little communities around stuff that I could get into. So I really got into gospel music for a while and began, um, you know, like going to Gaither concerts and that kind of thing, and I would get CDs and review them and, um, and stuff. So, and then I also was always very interested in film, and so I would mix that up sometimes with movie reviews and bits of film commentary and stuff. Um, meanwhile, just in my homeschooling, I was studying all kinds of things really intensively. I was studying literature and history very intensively um, and getting just a really solid grounding and all that. So gradually, as I got into college more, I decided I wanted to try to become a more serious writer, a more mature writer, and see if I could do some real freelancing. Um, so I began to pitch a few things here and there. I began to pitch a few um, op-eds on things and began sort of honing my craft. 
Um, you know, I look back now at <laughs> things I wrote in college, I go, oh, oh gosh, I wrote that? That is so <laughs> top. It just, no, ah, uh, no, nah, I can't look, I can't read this. Um, but there's, you know, there's obviously talent there. It's just very, very, very raw and informed. And so then, you know, the, my college and grad school years have just been a process of practicing a lot um, and, and getting my craft down and kind of expanding my repertoire. And uh, so, you know, I, I had already kind of uh, gotten to a place where I, I feel like I had a pretty distinctive style, a pretty distinctive voice by 2018, which is when I discovered Jordan Peterson. Um, and then that has been what's really changed things for me because, um, you know, a following, so to speak. I didn't go on shows like Unbelievable or whatnot. Um, but that kind of changed everything. Well, there you go. I mean, I mean, I think I think it's really kind of signified a real change in like the discussion, especially since Jordan Peterson's become an enormous phenomenon. I know we, I just had uh, Emily Urban on a couple weeks ago, and we talked about that from the his his kind of rise from the perspective of more traditionalist Christians, and how and to what degree his uh, ideas are useful coming for, if you are purely Christian, because obviously you get kind of the people who are. Uh, the, I guess the Vox Day types who think he's a horrific heretic that will burn in hell for all eternity because he's he's because instead of having figured out his beliefs he's just kind of working through them and then you get the people that are like Jordan Peterson converted me to Christianity and if you, you kind of run the full gambit of reactions that obviously you're oh well yeah I mean the Vox Day is a whole thing unto itself I mean, oh. there's there's so many yeah <laughs> he's an ex well he is an extreme and i have a couple of friends who are super into him and yeah that's a you can you can you can go that's a no, um, go there that's a right yeah let's not go there today <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there uh but i but it, it that point is that just he's just one of the extremes and i think that you you're kind of part of the reticent i guess neo-christian resurgence online which is kind of fascinating considering just how much the internet has always been such a primarily secular atheist place i'm assuming you've noticed that too yeah i have i have and it's been nice um like i, I had a friend on twitter who said you know my intellectual twitter and my christian twitter don't really overlap very much so it's really nice to have you in my feed <laughs> well there you go i mean you're you're starting to go on like all the big, uh, the the most uh, cutting edge channels that are discussing everything as it as it stands. I think, I mean, obviously, if you go back in like five years ago, it was everything was just the skeptics versus everyone else online. So it, the fact that we're at a place now where you're starting to see a lot of those channels starting to kind of come come around on Christianity, it's it's fascinating. It really is. I I, I don't know if you follow a. Uh blog called Slate Art Hodex. Um, I would really recommend it if, if you haven't come across it yet, but he had a great, great article recently about um, the, the rise and fall of new atheism, which it's just fascinating, kind of analyzing these online trends um, and how it kind of rose and fell, and then it kind of gave way to wokeness and all this stuff, and how, you know, now we look back and we hit and said, Sam Harris, we go, this is like dated. Like this feels really this feels like a time capsule or something like a like a nine one one time capsule in a way. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it was ultimately kind of a reactionary answer to just the right, the the conservative right of the early twentieth century and its ex excesses more than it was necessarily something that could sustain itself in the long run. As um, does that make sense? Oh yeah, sure. Um, and that's actually something. So what one of the most exciting things I got to do recently was I, I just coming off a talk I recorded with Douglas Murray uh, for the Unbelievable show and we actually got into this very topic at, at the end because we were we were discussing this sort of possible resurgence of coming back in on Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach so to speak and uh, Douglas was talking about how he's he could name people he knows of in you know, like the circles of intelligentsia, you know, thinking people who are sort of quietly reevaluating 
Christianity for themselves. And he said, you know, I could outline a scenario where Christianity gets its mojo back. Uh, that was the phrase he used, and it makes a it makes a comeback. Um, so I'm not uh, I'm not just pessimistic about that at all, which was really interesting to hear coming from a guy who's still uh, still an atheist himself. Yeah, I mean that that seems to be the answer that is coming up the most right now. As you start seeing is people like Jordan Peterson, for all their intellectual or spiritual faults, they're 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 polyps on the face of the in the Enlightenment. They're they're little people. They're I, it's 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 proof that the Enlightenment ideals are not as much as important as we can agree they are, Mr. Pinker, but. It's imp that there's mm -hmm. some, there's ultimately something lacking in the modern discourse, and that being the massive meaning gap that's come massively into focus on the internet. I, I don't know how much yeah, that, I, I don't know how much that necessarily applies in real life, normie life, because every time I, every time they do the statistics, it always says, "Oh, Christianity is lower than ever before. Christianity is less than influential than ever before. Wiccans are more influential than ever before." So I don't know how much our circle is actually changing the discourse or if it's just setting up a discourse where like the zoomers are going to take over and they're just going to turn the country into a theocracy but I, I, it's, it's fascinating to think about <laughs> oh yeah for sure oh gosh the future is going to be Nick Fuentes isn't it oh god that's a horrible no, no, thought no, no, to no, think no. about but... say it's not so no 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 yeah I mean that's that's the one side downside of the the zoomers becoming ultra conservative is that they're gonna they're they're gonna start going really far in the opposite direction. Well, that is an issue. I mean, that's um, that's something that that has to be dealt with. And the IDW guys to what they're actually saying. Uh, oh, they're, they're all alt right. It's like no, actually, they're trying to warn you about the alt right because. They're talking about how uh, wokeness can push people into the other extreme, um, and it can it can create these tribal divides where um, you know if all the young white guys feel like they're under threat, then the way Brett Weinstein was putting it recently is well, I'm going to go sit with my team, <laughs> you know, and so uh, then of course they they'll frame it in a, in a sort of how they, they think about it um and it's not that they're condoning that at all it's not like they're they're uh nailing their colors to the mast of nick fuentes even remotely they're trying to warn you about nick fuentes you know yeah it's it's really weird that the the woke left doesn't it doesn't do more to embrace like the kind of people that go out and like it's like those stories where you'll have like an a, a black man that go into the kkk and he'll hang out with KKK members and he'll rehabilitate them and help, like, make them not racist anymore. Like, I'm surprised those, those stories aren't the ones that the woke left is pushing, but in a way, I kind of, if the, the most cynical part of me is just sitting here thinking, like, the woke left benefits from people becoming more racist, if that may, like, it, it, like if, you, if you accuse a person of being racist and they say, I'm not racist, but the fact that you're accusing me of racist means I'm going to go start listening to racist people, and then they go... See, he was racist all along, but I mean, I don't, I don't like. Yeah, to, exactly. I don't like to think in like that kind of conspiratorial way because it's way too common nowadays. But no, I think there's something to it. There's something to it. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are going all over the place right now, but <laughs> in terms of discussion, <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can pick another topic. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. I, I, I'm, I'm rambling in my, my nature, as my writing suggests, but. Uh, in terms of like the debate from where you're standing, do you think we are kind of that 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 the, the what you're doing and what a lot of people like Adam Friended and Unbelievable are doing is hitting some sort of cultural vein? I think so. Um, yeah, Justin Brierley is a very important figure in this conversation. He's a, a very important facilitator. Um, I mean, like just on Twitter, we were going back and forth a little while ago, and I. It's like, you know, I have some suggestions for stuff Tom Holland should read. And, and uh, Justin was like, well, oh, well, I'll put you in touch. And so now I'm in touch with Tom Holland, and we occasionally, you know, I give him reading recs now and then. And, um, you know, like Justin bringing in uh, 
Brett Weinstein for his chat and whatnot. It's a scale is definitely hitting a nerve. I think also on a different uh, level, there's a pastor in California named Paul Vanderclay, um, whom I, I retweet a good bit. And he started a YouTube channel a few years ago, uh, inspired by the, the Peterson thing. And so he's been hitting uh, a sort of a more neglected or understated kind of a cultural vein, which is just a lot of kind of seeking young people and, you know, and wanting to have conversations and ask questions um, because they may be sort of for, either former Christians or, or never were Christians, never got me, and now they're sort of curious um, through the whole Peterson moment. And so then he's a, a solid reformed pastor and he's kind of set up a booth, so to speak, for people to come asking questions. And so he's really an important uh, figure in this, but one who doesn't maybe get enough credit um, or get, get mentioned a lot because a lot of his work is sort of quiet uh, or under the radar. But that may be where the real change happens in a sense at the sort of uh, bedrock cultural level. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is bleeding edge stuff. If, if it is ultimately going to take sway, it, that my, I, I, again, my my concern is the the normie factor, as I'm starting to call it frequently. It's the to the degree to which all this stuff is going to bleed into the culture that doesn't spend all day tweeting on the internet. Because obviously, if you have mm. if you have that culture that's seventy percent Christian and declining at five to ten percent every every decade, that's that's still damaging and when 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 the zoomers take over like we're afraid it like well how does that going to apply because a lot of them are on the internet a lot of them are kind of on that edge but you're also seeing the reverse side of that where you start seeing the one in th four millennials who think communism is a great idea or the one in four millennials who it's probably a bad statistic but who are all about wiccan and stuff like that so i mean is 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 i'm I, that, that's my ultimate concern is just to what degree we can actually start getting this into the culture in a meaningful way because it seems like there's problems there like even with like the well so now go you ahead have sorry. To educate me you have to educate me a little bit here so is zoomers is that a way to refer to gen zers uh i guess that, that's the the generation after millennials to my knowledge that are i think that have been people have generally started to assume are rapidly becoming the most conservative generation for a while okay so That is Gen Z, then. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's funny, that, that came up a little in our talk with Douglas, too, because Douglas mentioned how he's, when he goes around Europe, he's meeting all these tridentine Catholic kids, uh, to, like these young, hardcore OG Catholic types, and, and he said, that's an interesting trend. That's not something you you would have expected or, or predicted to see. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, but... Another figure I was going to throw into this is um, is Kanye West. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, while we're just throwing stuff at the at the pile here, I, mean, I think he ties in, uh, with what you're saying because you're you're talking about what what about the people who aren't extremely online? Um, you, you know, the people who aren't in intelligentsia, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, journalistic circles or uh, opinion makers or whatnot, and. Um, for those people, Kanye could be their like their Jordan Peterson in a way. Um, I mean, when his when when his album dropped, um, I was just looking through YouTube comments, and some of the comments were amazing. <laughs> you know, like people like I'm going to church again because of Kanye West, or like, wow, you know, it's I'm hmm, thinking about Jesus again, or that kind of thing. Um, My gosh! And, wow. Got a, gonna have an enormous pop culture footprint because um, there are way more people who are gonna listen to Kanye West than who would ever listen to Jordan Peterson. You know, and that's something those of us who are uh, kind of in our Twitter bubble or our twi Twitter niche have to always keep in mind. You know, we we know who Jordan Peterson is. We follow him, but actually, in a way, he's he's a he's a bit of a niche. Uh, attraction in some ways if you think about if you take a big big picture view 
Um, so I think for the big, big picture, what's happening with Kanye is going to have ripple effects for a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, he's Kanye's quoting Thomas Sowell and Jordan Peterson, so obviously it is bleeding down to him, and that's a good receptacle That's true. For him. He did have that... There was that screen cap on, on Twitter that somebody where he had he had Peterson's video on art, why you need art in your life, open in his browser. It's like, oh, Kanye West is watching Jordan Peterson. So there is a, yeah, there's a connection there. That's true. Yeah. So uh, obviously, it, this stuff is bleeding edge, but how it how it filters into the culture is going to be important. Like we, Chris, uh, the new kind of conservative Twitter that's conservative Christian Twitter that's kind of arisen. It kind of needs to heed the lesson of the new atheist movement, where it de we can't make the mistake of preemptively declaring victory, as all of ev all every single one of our intellectual opponents is just kind of recollecting in the background. Because every major opponent that the new atheist movement and the skeptic movement went after for over a decade came back or didn't go away in any meaningful sense. Like they spent what four years going after like the uh, third wave feminism and. That hasn't none, that hasn't really changed at all in a cultural sense. They spent a decade going after Christianity, and that kind of worked for a while. But then that that that's now resurgent in, in some in some circles. So we ha it, how we go about it is important. Well, and Islam, I mean, <laughs> Islam. So I mean, you can go after it, and I mean, I do think it's important. Um, to, to speak out against it the way Sam Harris does or uh, Hitchens or those guys. Um, but, I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to do anything. Uh, but there's, there's still, they're still out there, you know, beheading people. Um, I remember there's, this, there's something Tom Holland said in a podcast recently um, where he was talking about when, when you're, when you're confronting evil and you say, well, you, you're a Nazi when you say that. And he goes, but then what if, what if they turn around and look at you and they say, yeah, I'm a Nazi. What do you do? <laughs> you know, like, cause it's, it's like, if you're, if you're this free thinking humanist atheist type, um, you, you're like stuck at this, at this dead end in the face of like pure evil, you know? Yeah, I mean, obviously that's kind of the the rut they've the far left has dug itself into, where you do where you, they're castigating all white men as the 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 doer the the ne'er do wells of Western civilization. It's that's how you get the alt right. That's how you get people are saying like, yeah, I'm I'm a white supremacist and proud. I'm fine with it. I'm like, oh yeah. You good? You kind of cut out there for a second. Yep, I'm good. All right, cool. Just wanted to make sure. But yeah, I mean, obviously, there's an enormous dance involved in all this, and a lot of it's, a lot of it's out of our control, depending on how all this goes down in the next couple of years. Not to sound bleak about it, but. <laughs> now, you know, my one of my favorite characters in the Chronicle of Narnia is uh, is Puddleglum the Marshwiggle, um, in the in the silver chair. And so he's always the one going around saying, well, you know, I shouldn't wonder if if all this comes falling down, you know. Um, I, I also, I love Peter Hitchens a lot. Peter is Christopher Hitchens' good brother. And uh, he was doing an interview in Australia with uh, John Anderson. And Anderson's really kind of optimistic interviewer. And Peter Hitchens is super not optimistic. He's really, really pessimistic. So <laughs> Anderson keeps trying to get Peter to say something hopeful about culture or where history is going or whatnot. And Peter goes, if you're looking for hope, you've come to the wrong shop. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I love that. I come, I'm like, oh, you are so adorable here. Come let me give you a hug. You adorable old pessimist, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously there's a case to be for pessimism to be made on, especially out of conservative circles. I, I, I wouldn't, I, I should reinforce that I am not by my nature, like a, we're in the final stages of the Roman Empire kind of person who's like, everything is crumbling around us, as you can clearly see. I'm like, no, things are things are kind of worse, like, 
50 years ago when people were getting assassinated on the streets and yeah yeah the, the cold war period was not great world war ii wasn't great we're, you know we're, <laughs> we're kind of just not don't have any perspective at all we're we're doing okay we're, we're in the grand yeah. scheme of things we're doing okay but I, I mean obviously we we care because we want to keep things from getting worse we don't we, ideally 20 years from now maybe we can have a culture where things are a little bit more sedentary and things are kind of we we get the we get to the bottom half of the great cultural pendulum that's always going on between the left and the right where we go through a couple years of chaos and then we go through a couple years of pet cultural petrification and then a couple years of chaos and we're pr i think we're going to hit that the 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 end of the crazy with a uh, sooner than later but obviously it's kind of up to us to individually work it out i mean i i just went and saw uh the terrence malick movie a hidden life a couple of days ago and that movie uh, i'm so jealous it's not playing anywhere near me i think it's because of um it's it's, it's limited release it's gonna get it's gonna get like a january release for the oscars but Okay. I, I, I saw it in Chicago because I, I live in the worst state, so my my uh, consolidation prize is I get movies before everyone else. But There you go. Uh, I went and saw it, and that movie really does a good job addressing the idea of how the individual has to kind of deal with meeting out injustice in the face of a society that asks them to do, to quietly abide by injustice. And it makes a pretty good case for the idea that even if you aren't important or well known or you don't go down in history or if, if even if you doing the right thing has unintentionally bad effects you still have to be the guy going out and doing the right thing quietly just because it's the right thing to do and i think i think that's the lesson our society is slowly starting to reteach itself especially with the jordan peterson phenomenon is that society falls apart if everyone isn't doing the right thing for the right reason even if you aren't religious and i yeah. think and I, I think the more people start kind of, the more that starts to bleed into culture through people like Kanye West, I think the better that's going to kind of improve things. Because obviously, because I don't, I don't think everything that which cannot sustain itself will not sustain itself, and as, as things are going, it will not sustain itself. Yeah, yeah, I I found that very compelling in in Peterson's message. The um power of the individual to to choose you know to to choose to actualize the future just for himself you know if even if nobody else is yeah and i think that's a lesson that tends to get lost on the new atheists when they when they just say that that there's that religion carries too much bad stuff to be taken seriously speaking of them have you i know you talk to people like Adam Friended and Brett Weinstein have they have they shifted at all in their thinking since you started talking to them at all or I should clarify I um I don't really I don't really like know Brett Weinstein I mean we've, we've well, I, I, him... I see you arguing with him on Twitter constantly or uh well just a little bit just a little bit and we we do we do exchange some we, we banter a little bit at DMs and he calls me kiddo and stuff so <laughs> um I mean I, 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 yeah, like, like, he's like, hey, kiddo. You know, so we, we don't, like, no no each other. I want to get on his podcast at some point, though. Uh, so people were kind of telling him they should. So I, I think that might happen um, eventually. Um, so I, I guess, you know, you, that, that is a good point. You do mention that. I guess I did help to kind of shift his thinking a little bit uh, when he made a big long thread. Because um, he, uh, you know, he, he's just honestly sort of clueless <laughs> about Christianity. Uh, both in America and, and more generally, um, and so saw this hashtag uh, uh, Jesus is the Son of God, and started kind of freaking out. He had this sort of strange, um, low-resolution idea of a militaristic kind of Christianity that's going to march around forcing people to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or else, or something. I don't know what exactly was was going on in his mind, um, because he's got this kind of a utopian vision that he was sketching in his unbelievable dialogue with Alistair McGrath where, um, you know, if we all move forward and get together I mean, the 
largest number of people possible, then we can all be happy and live in harmony and, and blah blah blah. Um, so he's he's allergic to um, any kind of really bold religious declaration because he's got this odd fear that it could disrupt the utopian vision because not everybody is going to agree on the same religious truth claims. Um, and so, but as a secular as a secular Jew, he's thinking, I mean, I'm Jewish, but I know that doesn't mean that I have to believe that's how a lot of Christians too. And well, sadly, the answer is, is yes. I mean, you certainly do have your nominal Catholics, um, you know, you have your Episcopalians, you have your nominal Anglicans in England. Uh, so that is that can definitely be a thing, especially with mainline denominations. At the same time, I don't think that Brett realized just how many Christians there are still left who really do take their faith very, very seriously. Um, and so there was some backlash to that uh, on his thread. So I came in and Paul Vanderclay was coming in. And then kudos to Brett, he made a, a thread that said, okay, I didn't really know what I was talking about here, but thanks to Esther and Paul and some other people, um, I've kind of gotten a little bit better educated and I sort of understand a little more now what Christianity means to people and why it's sort of insulting when I suggest that Christians just believe the magical claims behind. Um, I like I, I, I get it now that, um, that a lot of Christians aren't prepared to do that and I respect that you know so I, I apologize for my my ignorance basically I'm not gonna lie as I was seeing that play out I felt kind of bad for him because it felt like he was kind of getting dogpiled for a little bit but yeah yeah <laughs> a little bit I mean I'm always nice to him I'm very nice to Brett but I like I'm like my dude Brett come on man just no <laughs> yeah have you read the Thomas Sowell's uh, Conflict of Visions uh, parts of it, and, and I read a book that was similar to it, or excerpts from it in high school, called The Vision of the Anointed, and that was a very, very formative uh, book for me in my, my early years. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, get I, I love Soul. I get the sense that Brett is, kind of falls into the uh, the unconstrained vision, wherein he sees mm -hmm. that, he, sees, he, he makes the mistake in assuming that there's some sort of end state to humanity where we can pass through all of our mistakes through some sort of transformative process and get to the star trek utopia but yeah yeah know, that's I, a very that's a shrewd point i mean that that's all i mean that's so common with like n not even just on the left but just with, with new atheism too is the the idea that purity or that peace and purity come through the removal of impurities in culture and that you can kind of tie all the bad things into our ideas as opposed to our human nature. I mean, I, I don't know if I would say the the, op, the opposing vision of that is necessarily perfect, but I think that there's something to be said for finding comfort in huma a humanity that where all of our problems are kind of caught as the tension between ideas opposing each other as opposed to ideas eliminating each other and getting to the end state, because I don't think that's... It's never going to happen on this earth, but... I, that's the thing. That's the issue. And I, I yeah, I, I talked about this with um, Andrea with the bangs on her channel. I don't know if you heard the podcast we did, but that was fun. I have it saved and on my phone, but I, I haven't listened to it yet. Okay, so the, the way I put it to Andrea is, it's like Brett thinks if everyone just got the same class handout, we'd be good. You know, <laughs> like, okay, everyone got, everyone got the recipe? Great. All together now. And like, Brett, people don't work that way. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 there's that, I, I think the, my, I, I, I'm sure you've seen both, all of the, uh, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson podcasts. Mm, oh, sure. I, there's I think. Times. I mean, that's how it, that's how it started for me. The, the moment in that, I think that most stuck with me was the point when Jordan Peterson asked Sam Harris, like, what is, a, what if a person, like, where Sam Harris said, well, how can a person, my ideas not necessarily apply to all people? And then Peterson was like, well, what if someone isn't smart enough to understand your ideas? And mm. Sam Harris, and Sam Harris just cut back and said, "Well, uh, well, are you saying people are too dumb to understand me?" And and yes, yes, yes. I, I think yes. that the, I, there's something to be said there for 
the elites not the our, our society's inability to figure out how to handle people that don't fit into the upper echelon i mean i i, yeah, I, you know. I mean the last century I think there's only been like two big ideas for how society can handle people that don't fit into their vision. That is the, I, I want to write about this at some point because I think it's it it cuts into an idea that needs to be discussed more in our culture. But like, if people aren't intellectually capable of keeping up with the flow of society, the only two solutions that people seem to have come up with are eugenics or the Andrew Yang school, where we just pay off the 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 people so that they don't cause problems. And well, I th you know what I mean? Yeah. So I I know the moment you're talking about, and I wrote about that in the the piece I wrote, which which went viral. That um, to me in all this, um, I I think I might have read it a little bit differently because specifically what they were talking about was um, whether people need need religion as a frame uh, to sort of get by if they're not you know, like rational or with it or smart enough to break out of the box and be just like Sam Harris. So I remember specifically the wording that was used was, so so yeah, like you were saying, Jordan goes, well, what if people aren't very smart? Um, and then the phrase that Sam used was, so you're saying that stupid people need their myths. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then Jordan kind of tried to go, oh, well, you know, we're all stupid. Uh, well, we're not that stupid, says Sam. And uh, so the, the way I read what, what they were discussing there was uh, that, that Sam was implying that Peterson was being a little patronizing, maybe. Um, it's like, oh, I, I see. So, so you're just saying, shh, you know, don't, don't wake the baby. You know, don't, don't rock the cradle. Allow, allow the people who can't keep up to remain... Um, Sort of in in it's got in their mythic framework for meaning making. It don't don't tell them, you know. And so Sam was saying, well, that's kind of patronizing because that implies have to understand any better or to know any better. Um, and then it <laughs> came up again. Uh, so that was in Dublin, and then again in Oxford, and. Peter said, yeah, well, I would, I would say that. And Sam's like, fine, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to put your foot in your mouth again. It's the same way, you know. Uh, so I like, I got a huge Sam Harris fan, but actually for that moment, I kind of found myself siding a little bit with Sam because I think, I, I think he made a sort of a pointed point, um, which is that you can't it definitely have this sort of schizophrenic approach where you go well yes you know we over here we understand how to keep all of these things compartmentalized in our mind but not everyone else can and so um, we'll just have one set of rules for us and another set of rules for those people over there and so Sam in a way wants to be he, he says that's an elitist attitude. So he wants to be anti-elitist. He wants to be sort of democratic about it and say, look, you know, truth is for everyone. Anyone can get this. And truth is always best. It's always best to tell people the, the truth. And so... I, I now agree. I, wrong, but I, I, I but, agree. I mean, I'm, I, I'm coming off this... I, and I'm going to admit something I probably shouldn't, but I, I, recall, I listened to uh, Charles Murray's uh, the book that we aren't allowed to talk about a couple months ago. I, I, the, bell, the bell curse. Yeah, the one, the the book that shall not be named, otherwise you will be beat beat across the head. Yeah, I named it. Yeah, <laughs> I named it. Thanks, and I'm it. Th <laughs> thanks. Uh, reputation over. But I read that a couple of months ago, and I think that he addresses. Uh, I mean, obviously the book's infamous for what people think it means, but I think the book's all, is ultimately about how society deals with people that he called that he does aren't part of the cognitive elite. That being people who are just kind of normal and who don't necessarily fit into everything that that into Sam Harris's world, I guess. And he and he makes a good point about how how is this how do we as a society form our society when you need to be able to foster everyone and not everyone can compete in at the level of Sam Harris. And I think that there's 
Mm -hmm. that we, we need idea we need to kind of uh, part, of, uh, part of the debate as to how we're building our society is how do we build ideals that can work across everything and like andrew clavin said once the benefit of christianity is that it's not exclusive to any any kind of person because you can be a, you can be completely stupid and join it and you can be completely intelligent and join it it doesn't matter oh well yeah that's something i'll say that my friend paul vanderclay has said and i i think this was his phrase scales you know so it can, it can go as low down as needed and as high up as needed and so you know i could have somebody really brilliant who's sort of searching and who needs very high octane intellectual answers and they're there or you could have somebody who's not that bright but all he knows is that he walked into a church and church people were the first people to tell him that he he battered you know um and not just dismiss him for being dumb you know and so then he encounters jesus and uh wants to love him and serve him that's simple that's just it that's just the gospel and um and so it scales that direction too so i think I think that's the beauty of Christianity as a, a framework for meaning making. There you go. Forgive, forgive my long train of. I, I don't know how we got down this path all the way, all the way down to where we are right now. But I, I, I think we're. Well, I, th I think we were. I think we were talking about. So you, the, initially, you were discussing that exchange between Peterson and Harris, where Harris is ne kind of needly Peterson, like what? Where are you saying stupid people need their myths? Um, no, no, I, yeah, I, know. I, I, yeah, I get that. I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, but I think it's it, <laughs> this is all. I'm just I'm parsing out a lot of ideas in my head as we talk. So, I am. Uh, I guess I guess in terms of podcast management, because I know we agreed about an about an hour. I, there was there was. Uh, I did want to bring up before we kind of wrap things up. I did want to bring up uh, the flawed face stuff because you said you'd read at least one of the pieces I'd written. Oh yeah, I, I checked out your piece on um, "It's a Wonderful Life," which I, I really enjoyed. That's one of my favorite uh, old films. Cool. I mean, I, I, I've been wanting to have kind to kind of talk with someone about the philosophy by which I've been going about these pieces because I've been doing that series for about for over a year now at this point, maybe a year and a half, and it's and I I haven't been able to really kind of get any sort of like major either criticism of it or if any sort of major back and forth on it because benefit of the lovely people i write for is they they don't really throw that much criticism at what i write but the the sad part is they hmm. don't throw any criticism at what i write so every once in a while i'm like do you am i an unrepentant heretic you know, am i saying something wrong here yeah yeah um well you know i would recommend so this this is another guy who was kind of important in when i was a writer beginning to write specifically about film um but i really like tyler smith at more than one lesson um that's just a, a really good solid christian film blog and then battleship pretension is a sort of a better known not specifically christian site but more than one lesson looks at things uh a christian perspective specifically so um you know i would recommend if you wanted to get your writing in front of some some maybe more helpful uh, critical eyes in front of a, a different audience. Um, I'd recommend hitting up Tyler because he's a he's a, a good solid guy. to know in that in that area. Sure. I mean, um, the overall philosophy of what I've been trying to do with that series has been to kind of just parse out the details of how Christian themes can appear in places that you would not expect them to. Like, I mm -hmm. I yeah. I I I've picked some rather spicy films to try to hit so far like i did dogma i did uh, last temptation of christ uh, that was the only mm. one I, that was the only one i received any negative reception on it was it was a friend of my real life not someone online bizarrely but i, I my general mm. thought is how do we as christians living in a not i guess a generally non-christian society how do we parse out our uh the ideas of the culture that surrounds us because obviously we have to be in the world and not of it but we, oh, we for also, sure. At, that, uh, at the yeah, same time, that, that's... Uh, uh, these ideas always pop out no matter where you look, and I think that there's something to that. And 
I, I, you meet so many people in our sphere who are like, oh, you just gotta, we gotta make our own Christian conservative art, and then people do it, and it's not good because they don't have. Yeah, a... <laughs> that. We could do it. We could do a whole, a whole. Uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to admit that back in high school, I did like I, I was a fan of the Kendrick Brothers stuff. You know, like I. I watched Facing the Giants. I watched Fireproof. I had a crush on Kirk Cameron. I, you know, I did the thing. Confession time. Confession time, everyone. Yes, yes, yes. I confess. Um, but I repent. I repent. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> now, now I'm a super cool Christian who watches movies with swearing in them and stuff. Anyway, uh, no, no, no. I'm <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, I didn't. At the same time, I. Uh, I I do just cringe when I look at what passes for art in in Christian circles, um, and I see a lot of goodwill there. I mean, attentions and uh, people who might even have some some technical ability. Like there's there's usually some money that goes into these things. Um, you know, people who can get get around with a camera, and uh, you know, there's there's the B-list actor who comes in and uh, does his thing, and <laughs> you know. Uh, but I think it, uh, a lot of yeah, I think that's how it should be with those of us who are about art and film uh, to, to be able to say, yeah, this is not good, guys. This is really, the script is a train wreck. The, the acting is terrible. You're not writing interesting characters or stories. But we'd, we want you to be better. You know, it's like we're, we're rooting for you in some sense. It's not, it's not that we just have contempt for you. But we have to up our game. We really do, because otherwise nobody's gonna nobody's gonna see any of this stuff except people who already agree with you. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's obviously a there's room for good Christian art. And I think obviously like the Jonathan Peugeot types who are out there actually going out and using actual artistic skill to create things. I think that's that's more valuable than just creating something to fill the void. I mean, that, that's ultimately what I'm afraid of, is that you see all these movies that they just get laughed off of... that They, they get laughed off of uh, the internet because of what they say and what they do, and you get like a thousand videos. Exactly. Thousands of videos on YouTube, they, they say, hey, hey, God's not dead, it's dumb. It's... It, it, uh, yeah, no. It, it's, and that it's movie certainly is antagonistic. I'm not saying it's not, but... I find Catholics tend to do this best. Catholics on the art front. Ca yeah, well, obviously, yeah, I think th there's there's more of a tradition of artistry in Catholicism than Protestantism to some degree, obviously, because Protestantism tends to come with a level of austerity, and I'm I'm saying that as a Protestant yeah. who, because I mean, I, and obviously we we tend to be a little more, I guess, skeptical of uh, of icon iconography and things like that. And I, I I wasn't I think I was just reading one of your blogs earlier, and you were saying that. You you had a family member who was upset when they put a cross on your on, your, on their church without asking anyone. Oh, that was my my grandmother. God rest her soul. Yes. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, we it, it, it maybe that maybe Protestants just it's just it's the Protestant problem. That's it. But well, I I've just solved the entirety of Christianity right now. We need to get the Catholics going on this now. But I mean, obviously there, there is good there is good Protestants up there. I, I mean, when it comes to great Christian films like all of the stuff that i think people need to see it's it's stuff like a hidden life it's stuff like silence it's yeah. these it's these artists that are not necessarily pure christians but they're people that are actively fascinated by it and they're actually wrestling with it like people like right. it, i mean say what you will of mel gibson but hacksaw ridge mm -hmm. is, it, that has that movie is spectacular in its depiction of it is in its depiction of uh, faith, and I'm not seeing that. Uh, but... Mel, is, Mel is an interesting cat because he's so screwed up but so brilliant at the same time. Oh yeah, I mean he's he's the quintessential Christian. I guess I was gonna say quint maybe quintessential is the wrong word, but he, there's something to be said about him as a, a good example of a Christian man living out a tortured life, at least internally. Very much, yeah, yeah. But in... tortured Christian art. I mean, that's what I love about those films, and I, the only thing I generally fear when I'm writing Flawed Faith is that I might be spending too much time uh, not 
uh, not necessarily just listening to people like that who are tortured, but maybe spending too much time trying to find meaning in art that shouldn't that I shouldn't bother to try, trying to find meaning in. Like like, like I said, I, the one time I ever got pushed back on Flawed Bank was when I wrote my piece talking about The Last Temptation of Christ, which is obviously mm -hmm. one, one of the most Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree with you. Yeah, I, I think that's a healthy worry to have. I think you can try too hard sometimes. Um, it, you, you can come to a piece of art over-determined to find good things to say about it, and then after a while you realize, you know, I'm I tried to talk myself into saying this is profound, but I don't actually believe it. I don't actually think this is profound. And it's okay, you know, it's... I mean, this piece of art isn't as profound as it thinks it is, you know? Yeah, I mean, the, the trolley side of my brain says I should try to go after something like Life of Brian and, like, how can I prove that this movie has something affirmative to say about God? And I, and I, I go back and watch it, and I'm like, uh, nah. <laughs> yeah, this isn't working. I can't... It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm gonna try. Right, right. Someday I'm gonna try. Someday I'm gonna try just because I think that'd be funny. But I, there, even I have my limits. Like I'm, I'm not gonna try watching, I don't know, Sallow and try to find the, the the affirmative religious themes in Sallow. Like there's, there's, there's some. There are there are hopeless cases. Oh yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I think I I don't know what else to say on that front. But did you have anything else you wanted to talk about, like your recent stuff, or? Yeah. So actually, kind of related. Um, I suppose my own uh, most recent attempt along these lines is that I, I started writing my first novel um, last month, and so I've been doling out like little little bits and sneak peeks and snippets of of that on Twitter and whatnot. Um, but it is still very much at the early stages, and so I definitely don't want to overpromise. Um, like I said, I, I'm actually not as industrious as people think, and so I've I've got I've got to juggle it with other stuff in in my life that has to take priority. Um, but I'm excited because I feel like there's potential in what I'm writing to sort of be that change I'd like to see um, in terms of kind of speaking into the artistic landscape with a Christian voice, but um, a nuanced, in a nuanced way, in a, in a subtle way, in a complex way, you know. Well, I, have se I have seen you talk about that a lot. I'm glad that you're working on that, because obviously, I mean, I've, tr I've tried writing a book before, and that's, it it's a, it's an undertaking if there ever was one. It, yeah, for sure. And the way, uh, I don't know how common this is, but says that they're outline writers and discovery writers and I'm definitely more of a discovery writer than an outline writer and so I'll just I'll kind of wake up and kind of roll out of bed with a scene in my head and write it down and it comes from I don't know where in the story I just know it'll be there somewhere you know uh, or I'll, I'll have like well I've got these fixed points for this character arc and then I'm gonna have all this stuff in the middle that I haven't figured out yet but so I'm writing scenes all over the place and I've got like over a hundred pages worth of scenes and notes at this point, completely, you know, more or less unorganized. But it's beginning. It's beginning to take shape. It's beginning to be organized. I have the beginning and the end nailed down really well. I have the major character arcs. I think pretty pretty well nailed down. So it's been it's been a great adventure. It's been really exciting. For me, in my experience, it ended up being really frustrating. I mean, I I, I tried the book I tried to write was right, was a. Uh, an essay collection that was centered on the theme of how radical ideas self-perpetuate other radical ideas on both sides of the political aisle. And, and I managed to get halfway through the book, it, nonfiction, of course. Uh, and by that point, I started, I, I hired uh, Faith Moore to help me do the editing on it to kind of look through it. And she started coming back with notes like, this is very rambly and unfocused, and I realized as I was writing it that that's kind of the way I <laughs> always got away with it at Geeks Under Grace, because I don't, I, I hardly ever outline anything that I write. I just, I start with an idea and I let it metastasize and grow well beyond its limit where or wherever it should go. And mm. by the yeah. time by the time I get to no. the final article, it, <laughs> I get something that looks like an article. 
Oh, and, and occasionally it does actually turn out right, but every every once in a while it's just kind of this weird formless thing that doesn't really fit in any sort of meaningful way. And by the time I was halfway through the book, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to rewrite 75% of what I already wrote. And I, at that point, I just kind of like started hitting my head against the wall. Yeah, well, that was something I had to learn as a, a young writer because I also um, was very, very rampantly. And I think there was, um, you know, since, as I realized, if I can learn not to ramble and actually write a concise, you know, opinion piece about something or other, I can get paid for it. So that's, <laughs> uh, that will motivate. <laughs> so that motivated me. Not much, mind you, not much. I mean, uh, somebody was joking that the most depressing thing about the new little women is that, you know, Joe gets $100 for a story and you realize that the the prices for freelancing haven't changed since the Reconstruction era, you know? Um, so, but, uh, you know, that was a little bit of a good writing coach. You know, she always, she was always hammering bad habits out of me. So, you know, I mean, it depends on what you want to do, I guess. It, it depends on how hard you want to work at, at kind of honing that down. Well, that's the thing. Is like when you, when I, I kind of self-taught myself how to write because I was a I, I was a useless audio, uh, audio engineer major in high, in college, and that ended up being pointless. But uh, so <laughs> I, so I ended up just kind of turning into writing as my side hobby, and then that ended up mm -hmm. just kind of growing into something I was pouring like ninety percent of my hobby time into, and then I got to the point where Geeks Under Grace was like, yeah, well, you can come and do it for us, and then eventually I got. Uh, they, I was brought on to legal insurrection for the better part of a year, and then, then they got tired of me, and then I, and I, and now I'm trying to find a new home. But I, I, part of the problem of self-teaching is that no one, you don't have help kind of ironing out a lot of your bad tendencies, and that's that's the thing I've always, that's mm -hmm. the other thing I've been afraid of is, one is that I'm gonna say something stupid, and two that I'm gonna keep making bad grammar mistakes that become so ingrained that that I don't get caught doing them until I'm starting to like get hired and that ended up being that ended up being a huge problem at legal insurrection and now it's now that I'm starting to reach out to people to write professionally they're being like you use a, you end a lot of your sentence on prepositions Tyler and I'm like yeah no one told me not to so <laughs> yeah yeah that's a, that, that's but a, you know, I you you have um, you know, you be, I, I like your I like your ramblings. You you have you have neat ideas and and uh, you know I think I think we do we do need more Christians writing about art. We do need more Christians writing about film. Um, and, and try to write in a thoughtful and uh, in intelligent way, in, in Christian perspective. You know, like, like you were saying, in in the world, but but not of it. Yeah, but then I write two thousand words on why Last Temptation of Christ is actually a good thing. So who knows what I? I who, yeah, well, who, who you says know, who says learning, anyone learning. knows what they're actually doing in this world? So it's you're stumbling up the goddamn hill, man. It's like, <laughs> like Jordan would say. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got impressions. I've got impressions of everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, that that. Well, thank you. I appreciate you for giving me an hour of your time. I know you're theoretically busy, but I, I theoretically. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I have to teach. I have to teach engineering calculus class in a week, and I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing there. So I should probably go and figure that out. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, so, I, I guess give everything your stuff. Uh, give all your stuff a quick plug, real quick, and then we'll just call it a day for now. Sure. So I blog at the Young Fogey at Path Aos, um, and I tweet industriously at Esther of Riley. And uh, so you can follow my various um, freelancing escapades and novel updates and podcast updates and whatever else there. Mainly, that's basically the main place to uh, kind of keep up with my stuff. Yeah. If this, if this podcast sounded at all unfocused or unclear in any sort of way, it's because I could. I, it, her stuff is so comprehensive. I couldn't find one particular area I wanted to specifically hone in on. So, <laughs> may, there may, you go. It's my may, fault. It's yeah. It's your fault for be for having too much stuff. I mean, 
you, you need to get you need to get a central website and then just point at it. Where what do you do? What what is all you do? Go there. Uh, I mean, I need to do that too. Because <laughs> at this point, I've directed I I've directed short films and podcasts and I've write, written it. I've I have writing on like four separate websites and so there's no one place for people to go find all my stuff. But but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tyler. This was fun. Sure. I mean, if, if I can think of something more specific or thematic to discuss in the future, I'd love to have you on again. Oh, that's fine. It, you know, it was especially fun to get into some of the, the art stuff, because that's a side of my work that um, I, I don't do as much anymore. It's actually, kind of almost my favorite thing to do, actually, is to write about art um, and then to try to make art myself, uh, which, you know, I feel like sometimes people get distracted writing about uh, about political things or focusing on political things but um but art is important art in some sense i think is the the heart and soul of culture and so that's in, in the end i think that may really be where it's at all right we'll have to do something on that in the future then thank you so much thank you have a good day